Okay, ladies and gents, thank you very much for joining us here uh, for Switzerland and the EU. Uh, lessons for a post-Brexit UK. My name is Richard Whitman. I'm an associate fellow here of the Europe program. Uh, and uh, before we get going, some housekeeping uh, announcements, if you don't mind. First of all, uh, to let you know that the uh, meeting here is on the record. It's also being live streamed. Uh, so uh, welcome to our audience outside, uh, sitting at home. We're in the garden probably today. Uh, we uh, would also welcome uh, comments uh, on the basis of the hashtag uh, CH events if you want to continue uh, the conversation uh, in, uh, in the uh, cybersphere. Uh, and I'd ask that uh, if everybody could put their phones on silent mode or, or airplane mode, uh, please, so you don't interfere with the, the equipment uh, in the room. Now, let me uh, very uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, our speakers. We've got an absolutely uh, fantastic lineup in terms of experience uh, in negotiating with the EU uh, and successfully negotiating with the EU, uh, I would say, in terms of striking uh, a deal uh, in, in bilateral uh, negotiations. Uh, and uh, our first speaker uh, will be uh, Professor Kami Ray, who is a former president of Switzerland former Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs uh, for Switzerland uh, and in the role of President uh, and Foreign Minister of the Swiss Confederation that she handled relationships between Switzerland and the EU uh, and in particular uh, during that time when Switzerland uh, adopted the bilateral two uh, package uh, Schengen uh, also uh, and uh, she is currently a, a professor at the University of Geneva. Uh, our second uh, speaker in the middle is uh, Rudolf Dietrich, uh, Dietrich, who is former uh, Director General of the Swiss uh, Customs uh, Office, uh, and he's well aware that issues of customs and customs unions in particular are a hot topic uh, here uh, in the UK, but having worked at the coalface uh, with the EU uh, in striking agreements uh, on uh, customs and customs uh, facilitation, uh, uh, he has some very interesting things to say about how you make that aspect uh, of the relationship work. Uh, and our final speaker is Professor uh, Michael Ambul, uh, who's a former State Secretary and Head, the Director of Political Affairs in the Federal Department uh, of the Foreign Affairs of uh, Switzerland. He was a negotiator of the Bilateral uh, One package and also Chief Negotiator uh, on the Bilateral uh, Two uh, package. And he's also currently a professor at uh, ETH Zurich. And you can see uh, that uh, you can successfully negotiate with the EU and still come out uh, smiling. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we will, uh, uh, Professor Cameron, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So I have to thank you. Thank you very much for your intro introduction. And I have to thank you to, uh, for this opportunity given to us to exchange with you on the Swiss experience. Well, I just say we're not here to give lessons. <coughs> We're just a small country in the heart of Europe, struggling a lot to keep uh, our prosperity and our security. And we are coming to talk about just our experience. But let me begin with a bit provocative question. They're on the sides. Yeah, they are on the sides. Oh, no, it's not that. No. The first one, please. <laughs> no. Voila, this one. Uh, a bit provocative question. Is Brexit a copy of the Swiss success model? Switzerland and Great Britain are two exporting countries, are competitors on markets outside the European Union. And since uh, 1992, the year where the Swiss refused to join the European economic area, the Norwegian model, the exportation towards India and China have shown an increase of 14.3% in Switzerland for Switzerland versus 6.5% for Great Britain. So you see, <laughs> we are a bit afraid that Great Britain be out of the European Union because it will be for us a harsh competitor. But let's stop here with my provocation. Uh, based on a number of bilateral agreements that cover the EU4 freedoms, <coughs> the Swiss model comprises over 120 agreements, deals, arrangements. It is a relationship also secured by Switzerland's participation to the European Free Trade Area, the EFTA, and it rejecting membership of the EU's customs union. Partial access to the single market without participation to the customs union 
allows for economic cooperation and preservation of national sovereignty. By saying that, I mean that gives the Switzerland the capacity to negotiate uh, free trade agreements worldwide. For example, Switzerland has signed a free trade agreement with China, EU not. The EU does not like the Swiss, what we call bilateral way, uh, the way of a sectorial access to the European market. The EU says it's too complicated. It does not guarantee a uniform applica application of the European law by Switzerland. And therefore, the EU wants to conclude a so-called institutional agreement with Switzerland designed to cement the Swiss sectorial participation to the EU internal market. But, curiously, the EU does not offer the Swiss solution to Great Britain. Uh, it's true, Swiss EU abide by different logics. One tending to reinforce partnership, Switzerland, and the other looking for a divorce, Great Britain. However, this does not mean that there are no similarities or convergences between both situations. First one, institutional. UK is drawing plans for a broad free trade coupled with selective sector by sector regulatory alignment deals in attempt to get maximum access to EU markets while allowing UK to diverge from EU rules and regulations in certain, in certain areas. Switzerland and Great Britain relations to the EU are therefore based on the same institutional architecture. One or more bilateral agreements with the EU and are facing the same dilemma. How much of national sovereignty these two countries are ready to pay in order to get access to EU domestic market? And at the end of the day, UK will be a second Switzerland confronted to the same cherry-picking critics. It's already the, 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 the case, I think. Second convergence, the European Court of Justice. Uh, the reconciliation of different positions regarding the role of the European Court of Justice has failed so far, be it in the negotiation between UK and, and EU or between Switzerland and EU. Of interest, the British position regarding the European Court of Justice demonstrates a similarity with that promoted by Switzerland in the negotiation for an institutional agreement. The Federal Council, that means the Swiss government, seeks an independent arbitration court in the event of disputes between Brussels and Bern regarding the interpretation of those agreements that regulate Swiss industry's access to the single market. Brussels has agreed last year to speak about an arbitration court. Disputed is how far-reaching thy competency should be. And this is not a minor question, a minor problem, because the European Court of Justice has made judgments in the area of wages and working conditions at the expense of employee protection and wages. And that's why Bern accepts only a very limited role for the European Court of Justice, in which it would be restricted to certain areas defined by an independent arbitration court uh, as EU law. Third question, customs union. On one day before the publishing of the government, British government's paper on the Irish, Irish question, a BBC journalist called me and told me that he's interested in, interested in how Swiss borders are being handled. He asked me if we have any trucks or car queues at our borders with the neighboring country. I told him we do not have, but drew his attention on the fact that our situation are quite different due to the Swiss association to Schengen and an agreement on the free movement of persons with the EU. As a result, only goods are subject to control at our border. And as for the control of goods, efficient procedures allow for very little physical control, less so roughly 1% euro, uh, uh, at the border. And relating to, you can put the second one, it's a border between Switzerland and Liechtenstein. This is not a very significant picture because uh, between Switzerland and Liechtenstein you have a customs union. But uh, in the second uh, picture now, you have the border between Liechtenstein and Austria, 
Austria is member of the European Economic Area, Switzerland not. Austria has the four liberties and Austria is, uh, and, and this is the Liechtenstein Austrian border. You have no queues, but the Austrian border is controlled by Swiss officers. Yeah, so you see. And Professor, uh, Mr. Dietrich will speak about, about the customs union. Just about border crossing of persons. Schengen sets binding standards for the control of people from third countries. Since UK and Ireland are non-member of Schengen, they should be free to determine the quality and density of controls at, the common, at their common borders. So what I say, you don't need to stop at the border. This is the example of the border austria Liechtenstein. Uh, but I will say something more. Invisible border is possible. I won't go into an example I have for you if you want to have this uh, demonstration. The case Georgia, Russian Federation, and the case of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, where we couldn't put any border on the ground because there was no understanding of what should be a border between South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Russian Federation, and Georgia. And uh, the, the end of the story is our agreement couldn't, couldn't speak about uh, uh, checkpoints, uh, and um, we spoke about coordinates about corridors, put no names on the ground, you can find no checkpoints, and um, the, the, the monitoring of, of trade comprises three key elements, risk management of goods before they enter the corridor and at the end of the corridor, on-site monitoring and auditing of statistical data. So at the end, no hard border at all, but trade corridors and electronic monitoring. I think it's an interesting example because there we couldn't have any checkpoints on the ground, any physical border. Fourth, if you allow me, very shortly, the free movement of persons is another parallel. After Brexit, 40% of the free movement of persons will be done with third states, Switzerland and Great Britain. 10% with Switzerland, 30% with UK. Switzerland concluded an agreement on the free movement of persons with the EU. After a popular vote in Switzerland, requiring for, for limitations on the free movement, the EU was conditioning access to the European market and free movement of persons. It froze an electricity supply talks with Switzerland. Our, our parliament worked out a solution that dropped the contentious quotas on EU immigrants in favor of a national priority hiring system. The Swiss experience suggests that the solution for problems related to free movement of persons is achievable. Even so, very difficult if both sides, it's achievable if both sides avoid the all or nothing approach. Uh, if both sides do not put in question the principles but only tackle by concrete implementation by asking for asking for more flexibility in the implementation. Conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the EU might be reluctant to agree to the Swiss model, which combines the advantages of both the Norwegian and the Canadian models. Pressure on Switzerland. In December, Brussels mentioned EU Swiss equity buyers could be allowed to get admission to one another's markets for just 12 months, snubbing birds request to grant that for a vast length. Pressure also about on Great Britain. Recently, the president of the European Council threatened Britain to freeze discussions, including those of trade, if the issue of free movement at the Irish border was not settled in a way that ensured free movement of persons. So, it's really, uh, we are under the, not only we have some similarities in our uh, discussions with the EU, but also we, we endure, or I don't know how to say that really in English, but the same pressures <laughs> from the side of Russia. So, but I would say as a conclusion, despite pressure and reluctance, the Swiss model is in place and therefore represent a precedent. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move to Mr. Dietrich. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my objective is to describe how Switzerland handled its land borders and the customs procedures in the middle of EU countries. What is and what has been the challenge for Swiss customs for uh, many decades? 
we had to handle one of the very last customs land borders in Western and Central Europe. There has been and is still a huge traffic of goods and persons. There are 23 lorries uh, coming into Switzerland every day and more than 500 persons crossing the border into Switzerland daily. The Swiss economy is extremely merged and interdependent with foreign countries, EU and worldwide. The border crossings or border posts are often situated in the middle of urban agglomerations, which means that there is absolutely no space to park vehicles. Swiss companies and people insist on a non-noticeable border, not an invisible one, but a non-noticeable. They want to cross the border fluently. This meant that the first objective for the customs administration has been over decades already, facilitation, acceleration of border crossing, every minute counts or even every second counts. We have taken uh, a lot of internal measures uh, to meet with, these, uh, with this challenge. We have since the 1990s implemented computerized declarations for the commercial goods. You could since the 90s declare uh, 24 hours a day and seven days a week electronically. We had put in place a system of authorized consigners or authorized consignees with defined duties, but on the other hand, privileges in the customs procedures. The physical controls were normally made at the domicile of the companies and uh, not at the border posts in order to accelerate the border crossing and to avoid traffic congestion at the border. We had or we hope we, we had uh, a sophisticated and computer-based risk analysis and this allowed us to have therefore a very low percentage of physical controls for the commercial goods, roughly 1% of the goods are really physically uh, controlled. We have also uh, put in place a system of facilitated regimes for standardized goods, for example, in regional traffic, uh, construction material, who did not declare every consignment, every single consignment, but only uh, at the end of a, a month. These were our internal measures. But in the handling of a land border, you always depend on the partner across the border. You can do nothing of your own. That means that international cooperation and consensus with the partner across the border is absolutely crucial. And that's why I would uh, like to mention three uh, examples of, of agreements that we, Switzerland has concluded uh, in order, again, to facilitate the uh, border crossing. The first one is uh, our agreements on joint border offices. These agreements have already been concluded in the 1960s with all our neighboring countries. And they have regularly been adapted since when, uh, for example, the infrastructure had to be renewed. The idea was that Export and import procedures were executed at the same place with both administrations at the same place in the same infrastructure which allowed to, to the lorries to make one stop instead of two as it was in the classical way. Practical problems are discussed and solved pragmatically on regional or even local level between the concerned uh, customs agents and only rarely uh, on political level. Second example is the Convention on a Common Transit Procedure, also known as New Computerized Transit System or NCTS. The convention exists since the 1990s, has been concluded by all the EU and all the EFTA countries and include today also Serbia, Macedonia and Turkey. It establishes a simple and cost-saving procedure 
for sending consignments through a multitude of countries with only one and the same declaration and duties and taxes suspended, which is very important for the economy. This uh, convention, of course, is perfectly known by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs since the beginning. They are applying it as a, as a EU member. And uh, the convention is, in my opinion, absolutely crucial, crucial in order to exonerate border crossings. Third example is an agreement on simplification and security measures. This is the youngest one Switzerland has concluded. It is a bilateral agreement between the EU and Switzerland and operational since 2009. After the 9-11, the US and then also the EU had required the pre-announcement of goods and special security checks of goods coming from third countries. Based on this agreement, Switzerland is not considered as a third country and therefore exempted from the pre-announcement requirement in the exchange with EU countries. In return, Switzerland has to guarantee the same quality of control of goods coming into Switzerland from third countries through its airport. Finally, I would like to say a word on the border crossing of persons. In fact, also uh, with persons, we have the same very low percentage of physical controls at our bo uh, borders, uh, roughly 1% again in order to permit affluent traffic. We have every day 300,000 workers entering Switzerland in the morning and leaving Switzerland in the evening. And it is, of course, of great importance that they arrive in time at their place of work and are not stopped uh, at the border. So the, the traffic is fluent. You can observe it uh, uh, daily. Before 2008, when Switzerland was not yet associated to the Schengen Agreement, there were no requirements for the density or quality of controls of border co crossing persons. Schengen, as uh, Mrs. Kalmire said, sets binding standards for the controls of people from third countries. Since UK and Ireland are non-members of Schengen, they should, in my opinion, be free to determine the quality and the density of controls at their common borders. So finally, I would like to draw the following conclusions. There is, in my opinion, a large room for maneuver in the design of border controls for independent countries. A lot depends on the cooperation with the neighboring countries on the basis of a pragmatic and common approach and decisive is the spirit or the motto, <laughs> borders may separate, but customs connect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman, Madam, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. I have the honor to, to summarize uh, what the so-called Swiss model is, and then um, I'll do this uh, with the following slides. Uh, I call it the Swiss model for simplicity reasons, but mainly, basically, we should maybe call it the Swiss approach or the Swiss process, because it's not a model which can be copied and pasted, and uh, there is uh, not the intention to try to sell you here. No one of us has the intention, but just to explain what this process is. And the process might be, it's up to everybody then to decide an interesting uh, 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 way to handle good relations with our European Union friends. So how did it start, this uh, Swiss approach? It started in 1973 uh, with a bilateral free trade agreement. By the way, it was exactly on the day when the UK and Ireland and Den Denmark joined the European Union. That was not a coincidence, uh, it, was really, it was really on the point because UK went out of EFTA, we, the other remainder in the EFTA, could, 
could then uh, conclude a free trade agreement. So that is what it started. We call it, I call it bilateral zero. Then comes the bilateral one. There are, as you see, seven different agreements. They are linked together. They are all still in force. And uh, they are, let's say, together with bilateral zero, one very important pillar of our uh, legal relationship. Then comes bilateral two. Um, there are nine agreements among them, a uh, very important one like uh, Schengen and Dublin. They are not linked together. And now, as we are also in a process uh, with sort of a constant negotiation, one is as an outsider, but I think also if you are an insider, you are also regularly negotiating. I mean, Brussels is a negotiating table. You're negotiating with your European Union member country friends. Now comes the point, do we have the Swiss, maybe bilateral three? I think it would be logic if you look at the numbers. And there the question is, is the institutional one? Um, um, our former minister has just uh, mentioned it. Um, these Agreements are so-called static agreement. Uh, only Schengen, Dublin, and trade transport is not. Now the question is, do we get a dynamization of them? If, if there are questions, we are happy to reply to this. Now we move on just to say briefly what are the advantages. We have legal certainty and better market access. And we have then an agreement only in the <coughs> selected policy sectors. So it's not covering the whole specter. And um, we have certainly a level of freedom regarding legislation and politics that are not selected. But I insist it's a certain level. You're never independent and sovereign, uh, except if you are a country on the moon. But otherwise, you always have to take care of your neighbors and the important, important factors. Um, what is, what's here the point? Economic policy, then foreign trade policy, we are not integrated. That is what we then would call the uh, treaty-making power remains with the Swiss. Uh, we have a monetary policy, we are free. Uh, uh, by the way, of course, uh, uh, the UK also, as not member of the euro, uh, taxation and finance, then a social policy, foreign policy, agriculture, and I would say that is probably the main advantage, if there is one, of not being a member of the European Union. Uh, there are, of course, also disadvantages. It's ne never like it's just black and white. And, and uh, here comes the other part. We have no full participation in the selected policy sectors. We only have a decision shaping right, not a decision making. However, the decision shaping seems to us very important. And if you, if you uh, can use it, uh, then you can have a lot of also influence, uh, of course, uh, 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 within your normal limits. And then you have no participation of all, at all in all other sectors. Uh, I would say fair enough, as you're not a member, you're not allowed to, to, to try to decide. And then you have un we have unsatisfied market access demands. And uh, as has been mentioned already, the EU seems to regret it. They once said it's a mistake. I'm not so sure whether it's true. I mean, uh, as, an, as a negotiator, you're always, of course, happy if they tell you you have made, you have just taken the goodies and uh, you, you made um, um, the cherry picking. I mean, for a negotiator, it's very bad if, you would, if somebody would say you didn't pick the cherries. Uh, <laughs> but, but to be honest, I, I don't believe in it. I'm sure it is a balanced approach. Imagine these small, tiny guys from the Alps could pull over the table the eight, 500 million club. It is just, uh, just uh, uh, I think, uh, a bit too much. Anyway. Um, a word to customs union in a sense of summarizing, because my colleague uh, Ruedi has already done it. Um, just to give you the name numbers once again, the border crossing per day, huh? please check, it's per day, 2.2 million persons, 23,000 lorries, 1 billion goods per day, 
and then the, the physical controls has been uh, dealt with. Switzerland is not member, as you know, advantage we can conclude ourselves, as, as uh, my former boss said, uh, with China, we are in negotiation with India, uh, and I do not want to sell you here the point that due to this we are very prosperous. But it is a good thing, and then uh, one can uh, argue about uh, is this China free trade agreement of a big value. I think it is of a good value, but of course it will never ever compensate the importance of uh, an access to uh, the single market. Disadvantage, the border control, however, as um, Ruedi just said, the noticeability can be very much reduced. Single market access, one word, um, we have only sectorial access. It is something between the so-called Canadian and the, the Norwegian um, model. Um, we have definitely, we then the Canadian FTA gives, um, but we also have more flexibility than the so-called Norwegian, which is nothing else than the EEA, which is a à la carte menu instead of a full menu. And then um, now to conclude, what are the lessons learned? My lessons learned as a negotiator um, are the three, uh, are, is, is the following point, uh, consisting of three conditions. Namely, when do you have as an outsider, as a non-EU member country, as a third country, legally spoken, when do you have good chance? I say three conditions. Number one, if you do not, um, uh, Madame Calmire uh, already mentioned it, you do not question fundamental EU principles. <laughs> it's hopeless. <laughs> it's just hopeless. You should not go by it. As, as uh, it was with Schengen, uh, Madame, as it was with, with Schengen, there was also the question, can we have a decision making, and they always said no way, so we didn't even ask for it, because, but we said we want a good decision shaping, which we got, and which is absolutely perfect. So, so you should fix, you should focus on the flexibility in the implementation of the principles. And I would say from the outside, with a little smile, maybe the European Union has a lot of flexibility when they implement themselves their principles. Take the mastery criteria, uh, take the stability pact, you could also say uh, the refugee distribution, there is a lot of flexibility to follow or not exactly to follow at 100%, but only at 99% the, the, the uh, principles. And here, um, you see what, what I would like to say, you have to, f to focus, for example, on the instrument of a safeguard clause or an emergency clause, an emergency break, as it is debated also in your country. There are many examples of safeguard clause. I do not want to go into detail. I'll show you also a possible safeguard clause we developed at ETH, uh, especially also just to check once, would it be possible for the United Kingdom? And uh, we publish this also. If somebody is interested, we have it here. Uh, we can give you, uh, uh, it's published, it's uh, an article, and uh, there are examples of it. And uh, uh, just, just to show you, formulas are not, are not something exotic. <laughs> and um, uh, it looks just like they are exotic, but they are used in Brussels many times because it's a very good instrument. If you don't find a a consensus, you can maybe hide it nicely in a formula. <laughs> <laughs> now we go on. The second condition is you have to have a certain nuisance value as an outsider. If you have no nuisance value at all, well, they don't take it too seriously, yes. And um, uh, in the Swiss case, it's transportation, electricity, financial market. And the third and last condition is you should not only play the nuisance value, of course not, you have to contribute in a constructive way, and that there are of course many areas for, let's say, countries like us, or, or like, like, like the, Europe, uh, the UK, uh, to contribute in security questions, in 
in international cooperation and so on. This is it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs>
the EU is saying now we have to find a sustainable solution. We have to discuss about the influence and role of the uh, European Court of Justice, etc., etc., because it's, it's, it's not acceptable for the EU that in sector where we have an access to the big market, we don't follow the same rules and standards as EU member states. That's a problem we have now to solve. But, uh, but I mean, generally said, we have not such a lot of problems coming on the political, de on the level of the political debate. debate. Thank you. Uh, gentleman at the back. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, my name is Matthew Holhouse. I'm a journalist from MLEX, the, the, the news agency. Um, I'm, I'm very curious in, in the Swiss point of view of, of how you see the, the, these two parallel relationships interacting. Obviously, you, you're going to have a Brexit negotiation which will, and, and subsequent negotiations, and you've got the, the EU-Swiss negotiations over the institutional dynamics. Uh, we, we saw, um, I think before Christmas, you mentioned the, the, the short one-year equivalence decision that Switzerland was granted be specifically because of Brexit. How, how far do you see the Brexit question becoming a sort of obstacle for Switzerland and getting in the way of your negotiations, or to what extent could actually the, the UK and Switzerland cooperate and, and work to achieve their, their joint aims, which uh, you know, may well be very similar in some cases? I can, I can try to answer. Because I'm not in the EU heads, but I can try to answer. I mean, as I said, EU doesn't like the Swiss model, doesn't propose the Swiss solution to, the, to Great Britain. But nevertheless, there are some similarities in the discussion, some parallel in the discussion led between Switzerland and EU and between UK and EU and mentioned the domain where you can find similarities. Um, it can, be, it, it can have an advantage, this convergence can have an advantage for Switzerland, for example, because it allows that the questions discussed are moving towards more flexibility uh, between Switzerland and, and, and EU and between UK and EU. And uh, for us in some domain, perhaps, uh, it is uh, an advantage to see Great Britain trying to get an access in some domain where we didn't get it for, for now. But, in it, there is also an, a disadvantage, uh, I would say, uh, by the timing, because the EU can play against Switzerland in saying, uh, we want you to conclude an institutional agreement very quickly and use it against us to, and to show you uh, you are a third state, so that's what you will get, you will get, not more. What we gave, gave to Switzerland, you will have, and not more, uh, and the reverse. Uh, so uh, now the Swiss government has, uh, has uh, made a, a suggestion that we go quick with the uh, arrangement of disputes, with uh, the, the question of uh, settling disputes, uh, and uh, for the rest, for the things that are on the table, uh, to, for example, the electricity agreement, we we'll leave it for next time. We have a step-by-step -step approach now. Briefly add, uh, there is always the question to what degree can one compare these different countries, the UK and Switzerland. I would say there are three elements which make it difficult to compare. First, the size. UK is big, has more uh, power, negotiating power. Second, has a totally different history, so has also probably a different self-understanding vis-a-vis question of sovereignty and uh, with Brussels. And, and thirdly, uh, you have the Article 50 deadline, which puts you under a certain negotiating pressure. We don't have this. Three elements, however, are in common. I would say, first of all, I call it the sovereignty reflex. Is here and with us uh, quite similar. Secondly, a certain free trade spirit. And thirdly, most importantly, um, you will be, sooner or later, if this divorce happens, if, if you're going to realize Brexit, then you will be an outsider as we, and you want to have, as much as I understand, good relations with your most important partner. So that makes us, that brings us in a very similar situation. And I could imagine that sooner or later, or already now, you debate the question, how do we have market access to, this, access to the single market? 
and then if out being outside, take it, having to take over or not pieces of the Aki, the body of Iulo, or without being there. And then of course also all the institutional questions uh, with the Court of Justice and so on. So there the similarities are of obvious. Thank you. Robin. I'm Robin Imlett, uh, Director of Chatham House. Um, thank you very much for those very interesting remarks. I find the, the parallels fascinating. In a way, I suppose I'm, I'm just keeping the same conversation going uh, rather than going a new angle because Professor Ambu, you said at the beginning, you know, little Switzerland, why could the EU regret um, uh, giving it this combination of sexual agreements? Um, but as I think you noted and as uh, Micheline Kelly Ray was indicating, regulations change. Um, and we're through a deep period of change, and especially for the United Kingdom, we can have a nuisance value that won't just be positive, but uh, particularly powerful for the EU. So you've both mentioned dispute settlement in particular, um, but ultimately, as I understand it, the big problem for the EU is how do you enforce it when something goes wrong? In other words, the EU changes the regulation, UK says, oh yes, we've changed ours too. But then when they look at the detail, we don't quite interpret it the same way. And then how does the EU uh, punish or retaliate? Does it retaliate just on the one sexual issue? Maybe it takes two years to resolve it. You can see the EU, which is legalistic, being terrified or worried um, that the UK, like Switzerland, would be off the edge, not in sync, and yet under a big structure that allows it uh, a lot of flexibility. So could you say something about where you think dispute settlement might go um, the scope of retaliation, should it just be in the sector, does it go beyond, this is a big uh, proposal. And finally, some people have talked about an association agreement that maybe we need an umbrella structure um, uh, that the United Kingdom maybe should consider, maybe it's something uh, that Switzerland would consider as well. Maybe we need a different model that's out there that would help us overcome these very sexual problems and put them in a bigger pie. This is, of course, uh, let's say the most important question uh, we face, probably all outsiders face when they want to have a very close relationship, especially based on the, uh, the EU Aki. If you just have a Canadian kind of, of agreement, then you can evacuate them uh, to a very large extent. Now, um, I would think uh, the solution could be inspired by what the EEA offers, the so-called Norwegian uh, um, model offers, meaning that in case there are divergences, there are differences, one could allow each side to have certain rebalancing measures, especially in case when you would not take over new pieces of Aki. As you very rightly said, this is something dynamic, and we have so far static agreements, so they're not dynamic, but the EU uh, thinks, and, and I understand it very well, uh, that they have really a point, that they should become dynamic. So what do you do if you do not take over a piece of Aki which is new? And there, then the, the balance between rights and obligations change, and as they change, the other side, in this case the European Union, should be allowed to rebalance. Mesure de rééquilibrage in French, it, is a, it shows nicely that this should be possible, and then only they have to be proportionate, and the proportionality should be possible to be checked in arbitration. I think that would be fair. You could then not ask the same institution to check whether their decision is proportionate. Then you should really, I mean, just a question of fairness and logic, you should be, it should be possible to go to uh, an arbitration. Last point, the European Union, just to, to make this clear, has not offered the Swiss model, as I understand, I'm of course not there, but as, as much as I agree, but maybe you did not answer, you did not ask for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in addition, uh, this is a central question, and it is a question of the dispute settlement. And uh, the question is the one of the applicable law. You understand what I mean? It is legitimate, normal to think that in the domain where we have bilateral agreements with the European Union, 
and a sectorial access to the big market that we are applying the same rules and standards as EU member states. It's normal. We have an agreement and in this agreement the rules and standards are, are written. But it's more difficult uh, for us to accept that the EU and the European Court of Justice be the judge of all bilateral political relations between EU and Switzerland. And that's why this question is so a central question for the sovereignty of the country. And that's why our government said, okay, if there is sectorial agreements and the EU is, it is evident it's a EU right that has to be applicable, then no problem. But if you have a dispute, then it goes, first of all, <coughs> to what we call a comité mixte. That means where you have EU and Swiss uh, uh, fun functionnaire, or I don't know how do you say that. Uh, if you cannot solve the dispute there, then it goes to an arbitration court where you have a Swiss judge in there. And Swiss arbitration court should decide if it can, uh, Swiss arbitration court could decide if it, what is EU, if it, uh, EU, EU law or not. If there is not an agreement in the arbitration court, the arbitration court can but must not demand the advice of the European Court of Justice. It's a complicated system, but it preserves our sovereignty in the sense <coughs> that the role of the European uh, Court of Justice is very limited. And once more, it's limited also on the, on the substance because it is concerning only five agreements out of the 120. Only the agreement uh, uh, giving an access to the big European market, not the other ones. So you have a, a, a really controlled system. It's a proposition of system. It's not accepted by the EU now for the time being, but it's what, is, what we are trying to negotiate. Uh, I think to get to, pre it's always a question how to preserve your, your, your capacity to decide and, and, and how do you balance it with the necessity with your economic uh, interest because we have an interest to get an access. Thank you. Over here, please. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Folks. Um, I apologize for turning it to a political rather than a uh, technical question. Uh, Switzerland is obviously a very devolved uh, country with, a, with immense powers for the different cantons. Uh, the UK is not the same with its asymmetric devolution, but I wonder if you could comment on the lessons that might be learnt for the UK in negotiating with the EU um, based on the needs of the different cantons and the different parts of Switzerland, particularly where they may conflict with the national or what is perceived to be the national uh, need. Because it means we are all the time negotiating not only with the EU but also with the Swiss canton and with, <laughs> with the different services of the Swiss administration. But perhaps Michael Ambulance will answer this question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I think the less federal you are, the easier it is to get a mandate for you. So you have there a, a, a one plus point. However, if I'm uh, not to be cynical, uh, I could imagine, just as a reader of, of your uh, very good press and, and, and having a lot of, of, of a lot of respect for, especially also the professionalism in, of, of your diplomacy, uh, I, I must say there are a little similarities in the sense that I have the feeling that uh, you and we normally know very well what we do not want. It's more difficult than to say what we really want. <laughs> and uh, this is when we watch our internal debate, I, I think sometimes it is, it is this. We have different parties, as, as you also, and we have different circles and so. So one has a lot of, uh, one hears a lot what we do not, re what really we cannot have. And uh, there, I think, is the, is the political challenge, I believe, at least in our country. Thank you. Gentleman here. My name's Roger Murray. <clears throat> I'm an independent member and used to be a resident of Switzerland. I think you had a, a referendum on the subject of free movement of people and you rejected it completely. Uh, on the other hand, 
we hear that it's hopeless to negotiate with the EU on their fundamental principles. And you said, I think, that your parliament had fixed it. Um, I think it'd be interesting to hear just how you did negotiate two pretty solid positions from one side or the other between what the referendum said and what the EU presumably believe. It's for me. <laughs> That's true. We had not a referendum. We had the popular initiative uh, in 2004 who was accepted by the Swiss people and, and that was in complete contradiction with the principle of free movements of persons. And that was really a, 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 a huge question for us. Uh, what shall we do? It was a popular initiative is automatically in our constitution. And so we had a new article in our constitution saying we had to, to adopt con contingent, you say so, quotas, contingent, uh, uh, in, in, in our practice, uh, which was completely incompatible with the free movement of persons. And what, what did we do? It lasted a little bit. It lasted two years, I think, bit, uh, until we found a, a solution. It was 2014, the initiative was accepted, and uh, at the end we found the solution. It was 2016, I think, or 17, 16, 16, two years. Need two years of intense thinking, what do we want? Which balance are we doing between the economic interest, which was free movements of persons, and the political interest, that means uh, uh, be conform with our constitution, uh, really complete conformity with our constitution. At the end, we did what Professor Ambil said, we showed a certain flexibility in the application of the constitutional article, and we said the companies in Switzerland have to uh, give priority to the uh, working, uh, to the uh, mother, to the workers being already active in the domestic Swiss market. That means not the national, but also the, the cross-border workers who comes 330,000 300, workers coming every day in Switzerland to work. They will have a priority uh, because they are active on the Swiss domestic market as a worker. So that was a solution. It was a creative solution. Huh? It gave us a lot of, a lot of, it was hard. <laughs> but the parliament found the solution, the parliament. It was the parliament that at the end found the solution and agreed on that. And we had no referendum on this decision of the parliament. Because you know, in Switzerland, you can have, the referendum is against the decision of the government and of the parliament. And in that case, we had no referendum. That means nobody wanted to remettre en cause this difficult compromise on the free movement of persons. And the EU said nothing. That's why we can say, don't tackle the principles, but the implementation. <laughs> One, if it's a very quick question, please, gentlemen at the, at the back. Daniel Arthur, International Policy Dynamics. <coughs> Critics of departing the Customs Union for Brexit uh, discussions say that it's impossible to achieve a customs arrangement between Northern Ireland and the Republic because there's no precedent for this whatsoever. From your experience, do you believe it's possible to come to a customs arrangement at the Northern Ireland border or impossible? That's for you. That's, that's not for me, that's a highly, highly political question. <laughs> At, it, my, my, my firm opinion is if there are two partners who want, it is. The, the question is if, if they really want and at what price. That, that's what we're discussing the, the, the whole loud now. If, if, if the two parties want, it is possible because you have the technology, you have the capacity to do it, you have the capacity don't don't to not, not to stop at the border, you have the capacity to have no physical border yes. and nevertheless controls. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is possible, but as Monsieur Dietrich said, you have to want it. Not only UK, but also Ireland. 
Wonderful. Thank you. That's a great note to, to finish on. I think uh, there, I know there are lots of people who, who have wanted to come in. I think it demonstrates very well that we need to do more on Switzerland uh, here at uh, Chatham House. So we've had a, an absolutely uh, fantastic set of presentations and a great set of questions. So let me on your behalf uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Kamal Ray, first of all, uh, Professor Ambul, uh, and also uh, Mr. Dietrich. Thank you very much. Thank you.